In 2016, she was the victim of plagiarism. A very prominent Christian celebrity reportedly copied entire portions of her book. In 2018, my guest today settled with that celebrity. But there was little justice, and to this day, my guest says she gets bullied online from fans of this celebrity. Meanwhile, the celebrity, who never apologized or owned what she did, continues to enjoy the spotlight. Welcome to The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Roy's, and joining me on this episode is Carrie Scott. Carrie is a prolific author who's working on her 30th book, but in 2016, she heard a trailer for an upcoming book by international speaker and evangelist Christine Kane. And to Carrie's shock, that trailer included portions of Carrie's book, Untangled, which was published the year before. As Carrie will discuss, her discovery led to a process that she likens to David going up against Goliath. Given that Christine Kane was a sister in Christ, Carrie said she fully expected that Kane would own her error and make things right. But Carrie says that didn't happen. This led to a lawsuit and settlement in 2018, but just last week, someone posted on social media that Carrie should be happy that Kane stole her work. The only bitterness would be because of the monetary loss, the woman wrote. And if that's the case, then maybe you need to figure out what your priority is. In a minute, you'll hear how Carrie responded to that woman, and we'll discuss the broader issues Carrie's story raises. Is plagiarism a big deal? If so, why? And how is it that Christian celebrities get away with plagiarism, seemingly without any consequences? But first, I'd like to thank the sponsors of this podcast, Judson University and Mark Orta Barrington. Judson University is a top-ranked Christian university providing a caring community and an excellent college experience. Plus, the school offers more than 60 majors, great leadership opportunities, and strong financial aid. Judson University is shaping lives that shape the world. For more information, just go to judsonu.edu. Also, if you're looking for a quality new or used car, I highly recommend my friends at Marquardt of Barrington. Marquardt is a Buick GMC dealership where you can expect honesty, integrity, and transparency. That's because the owners there, Dan and Kurt Marquardt, are men of character. To check them out, just go to buyacar123.com. Well, again, joining me today is Carrie Scott, a speaker, a life coach, and the author of dozens of books. These include Untangled, Uncommon, and her latest book, Unafraid. She's also the victim of plagiarism, though, as I'm sure she'll tell you, she hates the word victim. But Carrie, welcome, and I'm so glad you could join me. Thank you, Julie. It's good to be here. So I remember when this plagiarism case came out, and this was in like 2016, I believe, that uh, we heard that Christine Kane had supposedly plagiarized. And I remember following this, and then it just suddenly went dark, and I really didn't hear much about it. And then I do remember there being something about something settling. But I mean, it never really became big news, uh, as I recall. But then last week, you posted something on Facebook, and this caught my attention. You wrote, my book Untangled was plagiarized by another Christian author named Christine Kane, not once, but twice in 2016, 2017. It was my first traditionally published book and contained a very personal story of sexual abuse that happened to me when I was a small child. In its pages, I unpacked how that abuse tangled my self-worth for the majority of my life and how God was untangling my worth from the world and anchoring it to Him instead. In the past few days, I've had several comments come my way about this situation. I've ignored them for years, but today I feel prompted to speak out. Each person may have used different wording, but here's the gist. Why not be happy your message still got out there? If your purpose is to spread Jesus around the world, then be happy because that's what's happening since her, being Christine Kane, her platform is bigger than yours. If you're upset because of a monetary loss, maybe you need to get your priorities straight. How very insensitive. In our world today, right is wrong, and wrong is right, left is right, and right is left. It's sheer insanity, but biblical for the times that we're in. You wrote a lot more, and we can get into that, but let me just stop there. What made you, at this point in time, post that comment and speak out? Because you've been pretty much quiet, as I understand, since that settlement with Christine in 2018. 
I think I hit my limit, to be honest with you. I hmm. I just haven't felt the freedom um, to speak out about it. The last thing I want to do is character assassination. Um, I don't want to look like I'm a woman scorned. You know, the the perception of people that have been victimized, for lack of a better word, um, it's people are very critical of how they respond. So I just chose to keep my mouth shut. I really felt like that's what God was asking me to do was just to let him be the the judge and jury and let him the vengeance be his and so i kept my mouth closed for a very very long time i saw comments come and go some that were very very hurtful and um personal and attacking Mm -hmm. but i just kept my mouth shut and something shifted when i saw these come through i just felt like my mouth had been shut And I felt like I had to go ahead from the Lord to say something. And I did. You did. And again, I said that got my attention. I think it got a lot of other people's attention too. What's the response been like? And what has that meant to you personally? Oh, I hope I don't cry here. Um, Mm. So when this first was released, um, it was just crickets. I, you know, I had my friends that supported me, my family, some close ministry friends, some authors, speakers stood with me, but it just, um, even, even the best, uh, pieces that were written by journalists, well-intentioned journalists just got, they got buried. And so when I put this out there, I can tell you, honestly, I did not have any idea what response I was going to get. I knew that it had been you know, swept under the rug and hushed uh, several years ago. And it really, I didn't even really put it out there because I was looking for validation. I just really felt like I needed to say it. So I wasn't sure. I was afraid of a mixed bag and I was ready for it. And the response, however, I mean, it has just blown me away. It's, I could have never imagined it this way. Um, I think last I checked, there were about 250 people from childhood friends to fellow ministry um uh friends to people i don't even know countless shares i think almost a hundred shares uh of people that just saw the injustice and wanted to support me and i've um it has healed some very deep places in me where i felt like um there was no justice to be had and i've been overwhelmed and very grateful but but understanding at the same time that's not what i was looking for i just Mm. it just felt good to say it julie it just felt good to finally (laughs) just say it and be done with it and Mm -hmm. that's what i thought was going to happen but um it got some good attention i think you wrote in your post how um people don't write books to get rich Very true. 80% of books don't make money. And writers write because, like you said, you have to, it's it's almost cathartic, you know, you have to give birth to a book, right? I mean, that's what I think you may have used. I've I've heard that from writers before. But I love some stuff that you say because you address plagiarism, which to me, it's become like, you know, overeating in the Christian community, like it's no big deal. And you write, stealing is stealing, the end. Anyone who steals and continues on like nothing happened has questionable character. I agree, but I've noticed, like I said, to a lot of Christians, plagiarism is like no big deal. You know, their pastor does it every Sunday. So why is this a big deal? Well, I may not be able to answer it for everybody, but I can say for me, the topics that I write about are extremely personal. And so I love that God uses me and my story um, in my books it's like it makes the pain that i've gone through you know worth something and he redeems it through my story so when i'm writing i'm writing about shame and i'm writing about feelings of worthlessness and insecurities and fears and things that have gripped me so much of my life Mm -hmm. i'm writing about things very personal and one of the things i like to do in my ministry and i talk about is just live authentically and honestly and so in my books i share stories about my life that i would have never thought years ago i would ever share especially not in a public arena Mm -hmm. so to know that when i'm sharing these 
these stories, these topics, these pieces of wisdom that I feel like God has given to me, I I do birth them. You know, many mm-hmm. times I'm writing the book and I have tears streaming down my face. I'm having to revisit the pain and revisit the the feelings that just tangle you up. And mm-hmm. so for those words that were so hard to get out of my body in a way that anybody could understand them, for those to be taken and used is is so um, beyond what I could even understand doing. And the bottom line is, you know, Christine didn't need my words. She's a you know, she has her own story. She has her own testimony. She has her own relationship with the Lord. And she didn't need my words to make her testimony any stronger. And so that's what was for me so difficult. I can't say that that's what everybody would feel if their work was plagiarized, but that's where I come from. Hmm. Well, I, I don't write about those sorts of things generally, although the book I wrote was very personal. Um, but, you know, generally I'm, I'm doing news type stories. But I I know recently I reported a story about John MacArthur, who was accused of plagiarism by uh, Dennis Swanson, who was a former vice president at the Master's Seminary. And here in 1994, he had edited a chapter in a counseling book. And it said in the first print, edited by Dennis Swanson. In the reprint in 2005, it said edited by John MacArthur and Wayne Mack. And he said, you know, I opened the book and I was just shocked just shocked, like what nobody even told me. And so this this is a case where, um, and I'm told, this is interesting, HarperCollins uh, Christian Publishing is the, is the publisher, and they said they're investigating. Every week, I keep sending emails. So how's that investigation going? <laughs> what's happening with that investigation? I kind of know what's happening. John MacArthur is a huge cash cow. John MacArthur is a big name. I, on the other hand, am not as big, is not not as important. And I, you know, I'm kind of guessing, although I hope I'm wrong. Harper Collins, if you're listening, please, um, please do something and 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 tell us what the results are. But every week, I keep saying, "What's the results of your of your investigation?" And we're still investigating. I, you know, I wonder if a year from now we're going to still be investigating. I don't know. I mean, we'll see. I hope I'm wrong. You know, this is a situation where it's called ghostwriting in a lot of cases, but this isn't even ghostwriting because Dennis didn't, you know, he didn't sign a contract, anything like that. But what is this that, you know, it seems a very common practice, right, in Christian publishing that people can pay for other people to write things and then they can claim that work as their own? (laughs) I... I don't know how anybody would do that. I um, I don't know. I, I, it's very difficult for me to know how anybody could stand up on a stage and speak, knowing you know about a book, you know, on, on a book tour, let's say, knowing that that book was not anything that they wrote. When we're giving a message, we uh, whether we say it or it's implied, we feel like we're speaking based on what God's put on our heart. So same with writing. When I write something, it's I'm I'm prompted to write it. I feel strongly to write it. God's leading me down a path, or we've been having hard conversations, and these are things that the Lord wants me to say. I don't know how anybody could stand up there and. Um, promote a book or a concept or an idea or an issue when they weren't even the ones that pinned the book. I, I don't even, I don't understand that. So you would still have not received an apology or any show of repentance from Christine Kane. As you said, you don't know how you would get up on stage and do these things, yet you're seeing Christine Kane. You know, she's on television. She's at conferences, a major speaker, I think speaking at some conference coming up, did you say with Beth Moore, she is still publishing books and, you know, she's kind of an an authority. How does that feel to see someone who's done this up there speaking about Jesus, about the gospel? I don't see it. I've had to unfollow (laughs) um, every um everything that leads to her and Mm. i you know i wish her well i you know i I believe that she's on a journey with god in her own way i know she will have to answer as i will (laughs) for all of the things that 
um, that I could have done differently, um, the decisions that I made. And so I don't wish her ill. I have let go of any anger or bitterness or unforgiveness that I've had towards her. And part of that process for me, Julie, was was choosing not to follow her. I just have to shield my eyes because um, I don't want anything to make my heart hard so that the work God has called me to do will be impossible. Mm -hmm. And I write about topics that are so fleshy and so um, driven by my heart. I It's important to me that I keep that as clean um, with pure motives as I possibly can. And staring at what she's doing does nothing but make me revisit hurtful feelings over and over and over again. Well, I should mention, I did reach out to Christine Kane. I haven't heard back from her yet, but um, I would love to hear back from her. I would love to have a discussion about this. And I would love to see her publicly uh, acknowledge what happened. Um, so if that happens, I will certainly report it. But so far, it hasn't. On your Facebook post, you divulged some details I hadn't ever seen before. And again, I think I followed this somewhat tangentially at the time that it happened. But you said that at the same time that you got this discovery about uh, Christine Kane plagiarizing and you had filed a lawsuit, you had another uh, even more horrific, much more personal discovery. And, and that was that your husband um, had a secret sexual life that he had kept from you. Um, you know, how did that impact the decisions that you made? Because I know at this point that you found this out, you were in the midst of a lawsuit with Christine. How did that impact the decisions that you made? Yeah, that was... Um those last these last few years have been brutal i would say that when i this discovery came to light about my then husband's secret life um it i almost heard the lord not audibly of course but in my spirit i heard him say to me get off of that battlefield because you're needed on this other battlefield and it was mm. so clear to me that I knew that that was what I had to do. And so mm -hmm. that is what really prompted me to um, change directions, if you will, and just um, move on, I guess, um, and stand next to my kids. We had no knowledge of this um, in our family. It, mm -hmm. We were completely blindsided on every level. And so the amount of hurt that I had to walk my teenagers through was almost insurmountable. And so I knew that what I needed to do is be fully present in this situation, because honestly, that's more important to me than somebody taking my words. I needed to make sure that my kids were able to, you know, stand and get through this, um, which they did. And they're amazing. And it was mm. messy and it was long. Um, but the three of us, we're doing really well. We just saw God show up in the most unexpected ways. And um, and I'm really at a place of peace in both situations, actually. Hmm. Well, hopefully we won't disrupt that. But I, I know for me, I was so curious uh, when, I, when I read this and then when we talked, uh, we had a phone call um, last week and just really curious how this unfolded, um, because again, this is somebody who still has a huge platform. And I should say, I've been d doing a lot of reporting on the Association of Related Churches, ARC, and Christine Kane is on the lead team of ARC. Um, so again, this is one of the largest church planting organizations in all of North America. There's a lot of people on that ARC lead team that make you shake your head. But given what's happened with Christine, that kind of makes me shake my head too. So um, let me just back up to 2016. How did you discover that your book, Untangled, had somehow ended up in Christine Kane's book, Unashamed? 
Well, this is a crazy story. So I remember, um, I remember perfectly, I was sitting on my recumbent bike and I was um, trying to get in a workout and I was on my iPad, just checking mail. And I saw a mail come, an email come through for her up to this point or up to that point. I really liked her. I felt, um, gosh, I felt a kinship with her because um, we had been through maybe some of the similar things. She was very straightforward. I liked that approach. She was not flowery. I'm not flowery. So I connected with her on that level. I'd never seen her before. I don't even know if I had written, written, I mean, I read a book of hers, but I had just followed some of the stuff she'd been doing. Um, so I see an email come through promoting her next book titled Unashamed. And I thought, fantastic. Let me look at this video, this promo video, because I'm all about shame. I mean, if there's shame in a 50 mile radius, I'm going to get it and put it on my body. That's just how I function. Um, and so I opened this video and I'm, you know, sitting there sweating it out and I'm watching this video and this just is, it's the weirdest thing. I, I really felt the Holy Spirit highlight a section of that video and, and say to me, go get your book untangled. I don't, I can't even explain that other than it was just this supernatural situation. And so I stopped writing and I went and got my book and I'm thumbing through all the possible places that I could have written this big offending paragraph, um, in this video. And I found it on page 55 and it was verbatim and it was not a couple of words. It was several sentences. It was a thick paragraph and mm -hmm. I'm listening to the video, rewinding it and reading and rewinding and reading. And I, I just, I freaked out. I, I couldn't believe what I had seen. Um, and I reached out to my then agent and that kind of started the process, but that's how I discovered it. It's, it was random. Had I never watched that video, I would have never found the plagiarism. And it is stunning. In fact, we'll we'll post the the audio for that, or maybe the video too, if we can get that um, of this particular offending passage. And you put it, you can put it just you know side by side there and see what you wrote. And yeah, it's like lifted verbatim. So we'll we'll put that up at our website, julieroys r o y s dot com. If you look under this podcast, particular podcast, we'll have it posted right there emotions when you, you know, first discovered this? Unbelief. I went into action mode. This book hmm. had not yet released. And it was two weeks from release, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I contacted my agent, my agent then, and she reached out to the publisher, to our, my publisher, which was Ravel. And she mm -hmm. reached out to HarperCollins, Zondervan, which was Christine's. And they assured us that there, that that was just a weird thing, not sure how that happened, but they could guarantee there were no more incidents of plagiarism in the book. And so my agent asked them to overnight us the books. Mm -hmm. And we spent the next several days by hand, looking, reading something and looking in my book for it and reading something and looking in my book for it. It was grueling. Um, and we found I, I have, there are countless other um, examples of plagiarism. And uh, we were blown away. Hmm. So your publisher was Ravel now Baker, Baker Books. Um, and then Christine's, as you said, was Zondervan. And you had mentioned to me something about there being like a plagiarism software that they could run, but there seemed to be some unwillingness to do that. Would you explain that? So I don't know the correct terms <laughs> because it's all technical, but there's yeah. some sort of software that um, that publishers have at their disposal that they can run through. I think professors might have it that they mm -hmm. can run through and to see if it's been plagiarized. They can pick it up from, you know, whatever resources they have, but they can find the plagiarism. We asked for both publishers to do this for us, and neither one of them were willing to do it. So that's what prompted us then to go by hand, looking, you know, comparing <laughs> pages and finding it, it was, I don't know if I slept for 48 hours, but we found mm. um, countless other examples of complete direct plagiarism in her book. 
you don't know how this happened. I mean, obviously, it's not an accident. I mean, unless, I mean, sometimes people talk about evolution and, you know, there's incredible order that just happened by accident, but maybe it was one of those. Um, but no, I mean, obviously, this was done within, you know, somebody intentionally did this. Um, I don't know. And I'm guessing you don't know, do you, how Christine puts together her books, whether she has a team of writers that does this for her, whether, you know, uh, do you know anything about that? My assumption would be, and it's an assumption that she has people that help her put the book together. She mm -hmm. puts books out fairly often. And I know that, I mean, I certainly can't do that, um, but I don't know for sure, but I do know how she got my book. Um, there's a process um, when you're publishing a book where you send um, a pre-copy of it um, to influencers mm -hmm. with the hope of being that they will take that book and promote it for you on Twitter or Facebook or wherever it might be, um, that they will help you get the word out about it with their bigger platforms. And when I looked back in my notes, she was, Christine was an influencer that I sent a book to. You know, if people aren't aware of this, this is just another uh, peeling back to see the evangelical industrial complex at work. Okay, so you've got publishers who are making big bucks, who are connected to the influencers. They help them. They want to, you know, publish other books with similar type big names. And the conferences are all part of getting the books sold, as are the radio stations, as are the whole thing. So it doesn't surprise me when you said, you know, Baker and Zondervan really didn't have a lot of incentive to help little Carrie Scott figure out that big Christine Kane had plagiarized from her. Um, so then, I mean, at, at that point, what do you do when you find all of these different, you made a spreadsheet, you know, and, and you put these things together. What, what do you do at that point? We spent a long time um, trying to connect in a meaningful and productive conversation with um, Christine and her publishers. Um, we reached out countless times. We um, asked if uh, my publisher would engage and they chose not to. Um, so uh, we talked, uh, had several conversations, passed emails back and forth. Again, my agent at the time was handling most of that um, on my behalf, but it was, we were constantly trying to fix this under the radar. We just wanted what was wrong to be made right. That was mm -hmm. what we wanted. It just kept getting met with no response, rude response, um, belittling responses. Who's, who's giving those? I don't remember a name. It was so long ago, but it was their legal counsel. They were not willing <laughs> to help in any way. Mm -hmm. So, um, Oh, I, oh, actually they did offer to that. Maybe they could get me some backstage passes to one of her speaking engagements. Um, <laughs> okay. So okay. I did not take them, but mm -hmm. anyway, so then we started reaching out to the, to the community. We were trying to find author guilds, um, community, um, organizations that worked with, you know, justice issues. We were trying to find attorneys that could give us some legal advice. We scoured the internet. We talked with other mm. authors, um, trying to find out what they would do if they had any contacts. And we probably were at this, um, you know, for at least a year and a half. I mean, I, mm. my, my time concept is not <laughs> a strong suit, but mm -hmm. it was, we were trying very hard to to get traction and handle this biblically mm -hmm. where it says go to the person where, who has offended and take somebody with you if they don't mm -hmm. respond and we did all those steps and when we continued to be met with just a very unwilling um, and mean spirit um, i think we decided it's time to look for help outside and and we couldn't find any and then finally um a fellow author suggested um, this law firm and I reached out to them and they graciously took my case um, and things started to roll. It reminded me a little bit when you first told me about this of when I was at Moody Radio and James McDonald uh, got caught 
gambling in Vegas. And I remember I'm stunned. So I, you know, I go to the senior VP of, of broadcasting, Greg Thornton, and I, I'm like, Greg, what, what the heck is going on? We got a guy gambling, you know, and he's on Moody Radio. I mean, this is so bizarre. You know, at the time, and I'm just, I'm in, in, you know, he assures me that they're, they're working hard, you know, with James and he's, you know, he's really repentant about that. And he's really coming along and they're pastorally helping him, blah, blah, blah. I find out not long after this that he had actually been gambling with the chairman of the board of the Moody Bible Institute, Jerry Jenkins. So that might explain a little bit why he continued to be platformed by Moody, besides the fact that they were selling a lot of his books. And all. I didn't understand any of that at that point. I'm just thinking, if I go to the people in charge, somehow they just must be missing it. You know, I mean, to, to me, you know, little old stupid me, somehow I think that gambling in Vegas and being a pastor preaching the gospel is incongruous, but but maybe I'm missing something, right? At this point, you're thinking, maybe if I can talk to Christine, this this is just a misunderstanding. And we did end up talking on the phone. Mm -hmm. We did, and I did think that she's going to make this right. Like, surely when, she understands how this felt to me. It felt like abuse all over again because, you know, I had some very personal stories in that book of mm -hmm. sexual abuse. Like it was not, you know, I wasn't writing about puppies and rainbows. Like I was writing about hard issues. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought maybe, you know, she'll, she'll come around and she'll help a sister out. You know, um, how many times have we reached back and taken the hand of somebody on the same path that we're on and helped pull them forward? I mean, mm -hmm. aren't we on the same team is was my thought like, so she'll make this right. And I think I was very hopeful and very naive. And there were some promises made that I don't really want to share um, that she was going to do that never came to pass and weeks went by and weeks went by and i remember calling her um she was about to go on stage at a big event and i think new york and she i think her comment to me was something like i know that you've been waiting a long time for this stuff to come through but four weeks to you is like one night to me i'm just so busy and i think i thought right there this is just not going to happen. Duped again. The hubris of that statement, like my right. time's more valuable than yours. I mean, that's how that comes across to me. I don't know if that's how she intended it, but, but wow, that's breathtaking. It was breathtaking. And I, you know, I had looked up to her. I had admired her. Mm -hmm. I had promoted her. You know, mm -hmm. I, I just, you know, I, I really thought that she would want to make it right. And for whatever reason, she did not and i can't do anything about that <laughs> hmm. so so i went that's when we started moving forward i think with legal and um and it just you know it snowballed from there and but then it stopped flat because once you know all of this had come out in 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 a discovery and or whatever we had shared actually didn't go to discovery because we weren't in court itself we were about to go into court Mm -hmm. um, but all the information that had been shared with her, um, when it started coming to light and then we had reporters, journalists were writing about it, some very well-intentioned people, some very kind journalists that reached out to me and said, how can I help you? Some authors that pointed me in the right direction that said, mm -hmm. how can I help you? Um, it just became crickets and it just, it was, it's the gift that keeps giving. <laughs> So I just shut my mouth too. Hmm. Hmm. And, and so people realize, like, if you've never been in this, I, I have been sued. Um, so I know what that's like. Uh, I ended up uh, getting all of my legal fees paid by the person who sued me and then some because it was completely, you know, it, it was without merit. But it is when that person has millions of dollars and you have very, you know, modest means um, it's scary. I, I remember in my case, when I was sued, I, I called my, my buddy, Charlie, who was in my, my small group. And I'm like, Charlie, I just got sued. It was by James McDonald and Harvest. And I'm like, I just got sued. And I remember he was like, Julie, 
you know, send me the lawsuit, send it. And, and he looked at it and then he called me back and, and he was laughing actually. And he's like, tell me you want me to represent represent you. I'm like, uh, I'm not really sure what he's asking. He's like, Julie, you have to tell me. And I said, okay, Charlie, I want you to represent me. And then, and then, I mean, he's like, we've got this. Don't worry. I've got your back. And, you know, if, if, if I can get paid, great. If not, I've still got your back. And I cannot tell you to this day. I mean, I am so indebted to Charlie for that because I couldn't have functioned had I not had, I mean, it is so scary to have your name and national headlines being sued by, you know, people much bigger than you that everybody else knows and trusts. And you're the, you know, the little person in this and nobody really knows you very well. Um, it's very scary. And to have somebody come alongside you is, is huge. It, but it took you months to do this. And, and you finally got a lawyer who said, what, wasn't he willing to take it on contingency, which means he doesn't get paid if you don't get paid. So you don't have to like, otherwise you, you had to divvy up what? I mean, tens of thousands of dollars at least. I would have had to, and and I'm so grateful to them. And you know, what's funny is I have had a couple of people reach out to me um, since then with their own plagiarism scandals and ask hmm. who my attorneys were. So huh. I've been able to pass that on to them. But you know, what was also very interesting is when you feel so alone and you, you have not found anybody to to represent you. You have not found anybody that will speak, <laughs> you know, good things into your chances of of uh, salvaging your words. I had a lot of my family and even some of my friends who just love me, and I know it was out of love, but they just kept saying, "Just stop. Just quit doing this. Just let it go." Mm. And they weren't saying that because they didn't see the validity in it. They were saying that because they loved me and they saw that it was just eating me alive and they they wanted the best for me. Mm -hmm. And so even knowing the motives and appreciating greatly how much they cared about me, I just felt so, I felt so alone. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, even my then husband just was not uh, super supportive of this either. So. It was a hard road to walk. And so when this attorney came in and said, yes, I see validity and you have something here and this is an injustice and I will stand with you. It was the most amazing feeling. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I did have the gift of a husband who stood by me and said the whole way, I'm, I'm with you. And, and still is because uh, I get a little bit of heat for the work that I do. Um, <laughs> I imagine. Just, just a little bit. And, a little. But he's always with me. And, and it's huge. It's absolutely huge. If I didn't have that at home, I, I couldn't do what I do at all. So very appreciative for that. Um, so I know you can't talk about the specifics of the settlement, um, but... I guess I'm curious, as you look back, like, what do you wish? I mean, are there any regrets about what happened? It's speculation, right? Because mm -hmm. the decision that I did make was absolutely the right decision. My kids are far more important than anything I would put on paper. So that was definitely the right decision then. Um, part of me wishes I could have gone forward. Um, mm -hmm. There was reason to go forward. There was justification to go forward. Um, but I also believe that if that was God's plan, then he would have cleared the path for that to happen. So mm. I can't um, I can't get stuck in, I wish this or I you know, hoped this would have happened. I have to trust that God is sovereign and this is the way he planned it to go before the creation of the world. And <laughs> I have to find um, my peace and comfort in his presence rather than wishing things had been different. Um, in my flesh, yes. I mean, in my flesh, you know, I would have put on war paint on my face and, <laughs> you know, walked the walked around the publishing house seven times and blown a trumpet. Like I would have done some damage, but that's mm. fleshy and that's, you know, but I, I have to trust that God allowed this to happen the way that he had planned, and I have to find peace with that. And at some point, we just have to trust, you know, vengeance is the Lord's right. and, and justice. Uh, this side of eternity, sometimes we get justice, and it's beautiful when it happens. But a lot of times, 
there is not justice this side of heaven. And, uh, I, and I know, even with my reporting, I always feel like I know what my job is. This is my lane. And I, but I've seen people who can't let go of it. And it's like, we did our job. We spoke the truth. And now, if, if people want to ste- keep following these people, if they want to keep po- buying their books, going to their church, whatever it is, that's on them. And, you know, that's between them and God, and God will work it out someday, but but I can't, I mean, I've seen it eat people up, and you really, you, you have to be, I've always felt like I have to be faithful to what I'm called to do, um, but I'm not called to do more than I can do, and we're finite. Mm-hmm. And I've had to, that's why I don't follow her. That's why I don't look at what mm. she's doing. If, if I know that she's doing something, it's only because somebody has said something to me, usually in a very snarky attitude, like, can you believe this? You know? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. Mm. Don't tell me what's happening. I can't, my heart can't handle it. And so I don't follow what she does. I mean, more power to her. I hope that God, um, is transforming who she is and and calling her to justice and doing all of the things that he has done to me in countless you know countless situations but i can't worry about what's going on with that bitterness and unforgiveness will eat me alive so i think Mm -hmm. when i see people post things like you should forgive her or you know if just when they do snarky things i just want to say to them you have no idea what I have done to get myself to a healthy, emotional, (laughs) fairly mentally stable situation. You know, like I have had to do a lot of work with the Lord to just continue to write and continue to speak and do ministry. So when they sit there and judge me on those things that I've worked so hard to not be or to Mm -hmm. not have like unforgiveness, it's infuriating the keyboard soldiers that get out there and just annihilate people. You have continued to write, which has been really awesome. I know you've done a lot of devotional books, but you also just released a book, Unafraid, Be You, Be Authentic, Find the Grit and Grace to Shine. How much of this book, uh, you know, I know all your books are very personal, but I'm curious, having come through what you came through in that season of your life, how much of of that informed this book or found its way into the pages of this book? It's funny, I looked back on this book and this um, Unafraid came out in 2018. And I'm realizing that as I was launching this book, I was in the middle of the suit. Um, Mm -hmm. I launched this book and I remember coming into my launch team group on Facebook and telling them what I had just discovered about my ex-husband. Like this book, so the writing of it was one thing, but the launching of it, I was just, I had to step off the launch team. I could not help Mm -hmm. promote this book very well because I was just floored, (laughs) literally on the floor trying to pick myself up just to get my kids out the door to school in the morning, just to pay bills and work and whatever. So, but as I was reading through this book this weekend, I knew that you and I were going to talk about it. It's so relevant for, um, for where I am right now. It's, and I love that because I wrote it then, but you know, as with everything I write, I really feel like I write it for me because I desperately need that message. And if anybody else benefits from it, that's fantastic. But I've been afraid to be who I really am for a long time. And so part of this journey of being an author and a speaker is working that out in public, is sharing those situations that shut me down, shut me up, made me afraid to be myself, make me feel very tangled and unimportant and unvaluable. And so reading through this book, it was it just ministered to my heart a little bit, thinking like, you know, the, the chapter I read it specifically was one about not shrinking back when you're faced with a Goliath. Um, and I have, I have shrank back a little bit. And that's, I've had to reconcile that some, hmm. but it's been a tough season. Hmm. Well, I know that a lot of people that, that follow me, that, that listen to this podcast, I know because they send me emails. And they say, 
one, it validates because there's so many people who have been the victims of church hurt or the victims of just abuse by people in positions of authority. And it does, it robs you in some ways of, of your voice. And, and it makes you question your voice because you have those, the gaslighting going on saying, you must be nuts or you, you must be this, that, or the other thing that, that this bothers you. Why does this bother you? And, and so I know it ministers to them to hear the, to hear this and to hear the story. But I, I guess I want to give you an opportunity just to speak directly to people who have been the victims of this kind, you know, it might look very, very different. I know you have sexual abuse in your in your background as well, um, but who have been the victims of someone in power using that power to rob something from you that they had no right to take. Gosh, that's a big request, Julie. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because I feel like there's a million things I could say, and I think it would be so dependent on what that person needed to hear in the moment, because there are different stages, we need to hear different things. There are times I needed to hear that people had righteous anger for what had happened to me. There were times I needed people just to put their arms around me and tell me that I was loved and that I was valuable. I needed, you know, there were other times where I needed people to actually do the work for me and stand in the gap and fill mm -hmm. in the, you know, make up the differences because I couldn't do it. So, you know, if I were to have like a blanket message for someone who has faced um, any kind of abuse or been a victim, it's the hardest when it's from somebody um, in the faith because you feel like you've found a team and mm -hmm. you kind of let your guard down. And so when that happens, it it catches you off guard. You just don't see it coming. But my, I guess my overall message would be that if you're a victim of that, like that is a real truth and you need to get help for that. And I don't know what that means. Like for me, it was, you know, the steps of, of talking with my agent and then talking with our publisher. It was, it was a step, you know, then going to, um, trying to look for community help and then trying to you know get legal support so it's going to be different for everybody but i think what happens is we feel so much shame and the difference between that guilt and shame you know guilt is you feel bad about what you did but shame you feel bad about who you are mm. and i feel like shame always accompanies being a victim of of abuse because somehow you find you're told or you feel like it's your fault you've done something you should just let it go you should forgive them they're a pastor you should you know take the high road they're a very important public figure or they're whatever it might be and so you just cover yourself with shame um and i just would encourage anybody that's facing that to to not stay quiet. Um, I don't advocate going scorch earth. I don't feel like that is what needs to happen, but I, I think staying silent and cowering back and, and letting the abuse continue or letting the abuse go unchecked is a disservice um, to anybody else who could be a victim down the road. I do think there's a time where we are quiet. I feel like there was a time when God shut my mouth which is a big undertaking. And then <laughs> I feel like there are times that God, you know, like like last week when I posted that on Facebook, I feel like I had permission to share that, but still I wanted to make sure that his name was glorified through it. I mean, I don't want to cause anybody to fall because of what I've been through. I don't want people to hate her. I don't want people to cancel her. I just want people to be aware and careful and, I would like her to be called to accountability, but if that doesn't happen, that's okay too. Hmm. Well, accountability is biblical, and if someone's faith is destroyed because a Christian celebrity turns out to not be or dis what they thought they were or disappoints them, then truly your faith is in the wrong place. Good point. Um, but Carrie... I just want to thank you for being willing to, you know, share so openly something that was was so painful. And I, I feel like uh, I, I've known you for only a few days, but I feel like you're a sister. And um, just really great to get to know you, and uh, do just so appreciate your ministry. Yeah, thank you, Julie. I here's one of the things I loved about you reaching out to me. 
in all of the journalists that ask me about um, this situation when it first happened, it was all about the facts. But you're the first person in a uh, in this you know uh, arena that asked me how I felt, and that was really validating. Mm -hmm. Just to have somebody ask me how I felt about it, not what are the facts behind it, and. I appreciate that very much, just the opportunity to share some of my heart and um, to just be open and honest about what that does to somebody to, to be a victim in that way. And so thank you for what you do. I appreciate it very much. Hmm. Well, I consider it an honor to be able to tell these stories or give them a platform. So thank you. Uh, I really appreciate it. And thanks so much for listening to The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Roy's, and I want to mention that we're offering Carrie's latest book, Unafraid, as our premium for the month of March. And I think this is going to be a real encouragement to all of you women out there, but men as well. If you have people in your life that you really love, women that are close to you, I think it will be a great book for them as well. So if you give a gift of $25 or more to The Roy's Report, in the month of March, we'll send you a copy of Unafraid and you'll be supporting this important ministry. Well, again, thanks so much for listening to The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Roy's. If you'd like to connect with me online, just go to julieroy's, spelled R-O-Y-S dot com. Also, just a quick reminder to subscribe to The Roy's Report on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. That way you'll never miss an episode. And while you're at it, I'd really appreciate it if you'd help us spread the word about the podcast by leaving a review. And then please share the podcast on social media so more people can hear about this great content. Again, thanks so much for joining me. I hope you have a great day and God bless. <music>